What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode. Today, I have a very special guest. I got Jameson Lop, which is a team lead at Bitco, creator of Satoshi.info, and founder of BitcoinSig.com. Jameson, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Not bad. Uh, this uh, space is always you know, keeping us on our toes, so there's never a dull moment. So what would you say is the most interesting thing in the space currently today? So, uh, you know, I've, I've been doing this for a number of years and uh, been going down the rabbit hole in terms of the technology and uh, trying to understand, uh, you know, how the actual protocols work and, and everything. But really, over the past year, I've kind of popped up out of that uh, technical rabbit hole and have been really looking more at the, the human side of things, the, the sociological aspects of these consensus systems and so i think most people are well aware that we've had a lot of drama and forking and uh, people going off and doing their own thing so it's really interesting i think to see how the quote unquote governance of these ungoverned systems really operates and what's your take on all these forks lately we had uh, you know B cash bitcoin cash you have bitcoin gold and i heard now there's like bitcoin silver and diamond all these different forks coming out yeah, it's um, it's really it's reminding me of the like 2012, 2013 altcoin boom. So I think that, you know, this is just another cycle repeating itself where we saw it around 2013 with a uh, proliferation of altcoins. Uh, people figured out it was easy to make them and they could you know raise a lot of money. Um, then, you know, earlier this year, we saw a similar type of cycle with ICOs. And now I think we're starting to see the beginning of a cycle with the new type of altcoin, the altcoin airdrop to the Bitcoin holders. And uh, it's going to continue until the market cannot bear it anymore. And I think you know, we might be getting pretty close to that point because we're having customers come to us at Bitco and ask us if we're going to support X, Y, or Z. And we're like, I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, <laughs> Uh, how are we going to support something we've never even heard of? So it's definitely we're getting to that like long tail distribution of like it's not really going to be worth the eff effort for the, the engineers to try to support all of these things because they're going to have less and less value. And that's a huge uh, issue in the space, too, and just not enough smart people that can develop these uh, very complicated technologies. Um, talking about governance, what's your philosophical take or what's your opinion on like is there a governance model with within bitcoin i think we're trying to figure that out right like there there is no official written rules or constitution though you know there's a lot of blog posts of people who try to draw parallels between like the american tricameral system and and bitcoin or or other you know governance systems and and bitcoin but i think that those are just sort of uh, loose approximations and they're always going to be missing something here or there. So we're still trying to figure it out. Now we know, you know, you've got two main options in these permissionless systems and you've got your, your voice and exit as usual. It just so happens that exit is a lot easier in these systems than it is in, in most other, you know, hierarchical governance. So people are exiting and uh, we're going to see how well they do and, you know, what the market uh, thinks of their exits. And so earlier this year, we had SegWit that activated. Um, I don't know what the percentage is today. I think it's above 15% activation. It's been bouncing around 10 to 15% uh, like by transaction volume. And do you think that had like a drastic change within like quote and quote out this like so-called governance model that we have? It definitely uh, showed some issues where uh, the BIP9 like minor activation uh, for soft forks was shown to, to have an issue where it's basically giving this like voting power or veto power to the miners. So the miners use that as kind of a bargaining chip over the course of a year or two and uh, you know frustrated a lot of other uh, participants of the community. So I think that like you're probably not going to see that type of activation get used in the future for other soft forks. We we may see more you know user activated soft forks so that uh, the miners don't really have that option. You know, it's going to be the the community uh, as a system in general that is going to be telling the miners like, "This is what we want, and we're we're going to pay you for it." And talking about mining, you know, it's very expensive to set up mining, especially in Bitcoin. Um, so there's a large overhead cost. Do you see th the actual mining ecosystem within Bitcoin changing in the next couple of years? 
Definitely. Um, I've been approached by a number of different entities that are, you know, working on their own uh, new initiatives. And a lot of this was just born out of the frustration of what I was just talking about, of the miners getting into a position where they're blocking upgrades to the network. And so there are a lot of people out there, a lot of early adopters, a lot of very well capitalized people who see the centralization of mining as one of the bigger problems that Bitcoin is facing right now. And they're willing to put in the time, the effort, the resources to make mining more competitive and therefore more decentralized. So, you know, we heard about Dragon Mint, which is supposed to get up and running early next year. And uh, I've, I've also been uh, speaking with a uh, fellow locally who is doing some interesting stuff with waste energy. Um, and I've also heard from some other groups who are working on their own initiatives that are, you know, going to use new fabrication plants, new type of ASIC designs. And uh, the, the system is going to kind of get out of this deadlock phase, you know, break the monopoly, if you will, uh, and get more competition injected into the system. So yeah, I, heard about, I heard about that. So there's new, uh, there's new designs for the new ASICs coming out? Yeah, I think uh, there are multiple different companies working on their own ASICs. So, you know, uh, the the basically Bitmain near monopoly that has been in place for the past year or so is definitely going to be challenged. And my, my funniest, uh, not, my, not I want to say my issue, but my one of my funniest remarks I give people, people always complain about energy consumption when it comes to Bitcoin. Sure. <laughs> I'm like, uh, do you realize how much energy consumption is in your Visa card? How much energy consumption there is on the banks and everything so it's like it's a it's a drop in the fucking ocean compared to everybody else but it's easy to get upset about because it's easier to approximate to figure out how much energy it is it's just that people don't have any idea how much energy get used for for all these other systems because it's you know hidden b behind various veils uh, there's no like single number that you can just pull out and look at mm -hmm. and still talking about mining I, mean, I, I have no idea for this answer. Maybe you do know. Um, is this even probable? Like, is there reasons why we can't use solar energy to start powering our mining rigs? No. Um, in, in, in fact, so like one of the things about mining is Bitcoin uses exactly as much energy as the users of the ecosystem are willing to pay for. And that basically gets reflected by the price. Uh, so, you know, everybody knows, you know, what the subsidy is, you know, what miners are getting paid, then the actual dollar amount is just based on the, the price of Bitcoin itself. So as a result, you have people who can get into, you know, competitive situations of finding, you know, cheaper and cheaper energy. So renewable energy is definitely uh, on the horizon. You know, I think what we see uh, in China, a lot is actually like hydroelectric energy. And, and really what you see is it's not that miners are just going out, setting up shop and sucking up a lot of elect electricity. What they're doing is they're going and they're finding the excess electricity that is already mm -hmm. available and making use of it because otherwise it would just get wasted, thrown away, not used. So they're just using, in many cases, electricity that is already being generated. You're right. Over here in Ontario, we we uh, create so much excess elect uh, excess electricity that we have to sell it to New York State. <laughs> so fuck, we should just divert that to uh, Bitcoin mining farms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so uh, you know, that's what I mentioned. The the guy that I met with recently, who is actually uh, here in North Carolina, they um, a, a while ago they bought this tire remanufacturing like waste processing plant where they take old tires and they basically burn them up and then they get all of the the waste byproducts separated and sell those out and they realized um you know we're generating a lot of heat and a lot of electricity from this and they were selling it back to the grid at you know like one or two cents per kilowatt hour and they realized we can take that throw a bunch of older mining uh hash power at it and be much more profitable by using that electricity ourselves rather than reselling it back to the grid. Mm. So, you know, we talked about earlier with uh, all these forks. So we had different like evolution, like in 2013, you had these altcoins and then we had the ICOs in the last like year or so. And now we have all these forks. And then as you mentioned, we have these airdrops coming out to Bitcoin users. Um, is there anything that is really concerning for you currently and moving forward? 
Oh, uh, well, I mean, there's there's always the, the scalability issues, but I'm not as concerned about that because there's a lot of people working on them. What is really more concerning to me now um, is that even though we've had these contentious hard forks, there has not been a clean sociological split. So there's mm. still a lot of fighting and and really the uh, the the war for Bitcoin, if you will, has moved from a technical scaling argument to a social uh, like branding argument. So now you know you have the Bitcoin Cash is Bitcoin or the Bitcoin Cash is Satoshi's vision. Uh, you know all of the the rhetoric has basically pivoted a little bit. So instead of it being, you know, this is our vision for Bitcoin, it is now, this is our vision and we've implemented it, but you have to go use this fork and now we're gonna do, you know, big marketing drive. So uh, the the game has changed a little bit, but there, it's still this uh, massive argument and really um, battle for, I guess, mind share and general like user acceptance. What do you say? Do you believe in like a free market? Like, let's say you have Bitcoin Cash. Well, we do have Bitcoin Cash, and we have Bitcoin. Yep. Uh, at the end of the day, the best product wins, or the best system wins. I believe so. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think that the market is speaking right now. Every moment, it's telling <laughs> us, you know, which system that it thinks is more valuable. Um, you know, I have various reasons why I believe that the. The various statistics uh, for for Bitcoin Cash might be a bit overinflated, um, that, but that's like one of the reasons why we're we're seeing all of these uh, airdropped altcoins is because they can then use the very easily manipulated market cap metric to to make it look like they're a lot bigger than they really are. Because in reality, the the vast majority of Bitcoin holders are not keeping track of all of this drama and mm -hmm. they're not going to go try to find the right software to be able to claim their coins on a fork to sell them or you know convert them to something else. And so really, I think the vast majority of coins on these uh, airdrop forks are just locked up and probably never going to be touched. So the market caps for them are even more inflated than the market cap for Bitcoin, which you could argue is inflated because there's probably you know several million Bitcoins that have been lost forever and they're never going to get used. What's your take on all these whole futures markets? I think they're going live like mid-December. Yeah, that's uh, exciting. Um, some some people seem to think that they're going to open up opportunities for institutions to short Bitcoin into the ground, but uh, I'm I'm expecting probably the opposite. I mean, mm -hmm. shorting Bitcoin has almost never been a very good proposition. I don't think that like increasing the volume of the shorts is going to really change that. It's you know it's such a scarce digital asset, uh, and the demand just continues to increase. So we'll see. Um, I think most people agree that it will be like uh, providing better liquidity, better price discovery in general. I'm actually curious uh, to witness once scaling is implemented. Like, let's say we have Lightning Network whenever that goes live, and that gives more accessibility, cheaper transactions, micropayments can actually be utilized. I'm more curious then what the price would actually reflect the value of. Yeah, and and this is. Something that I've been thinking about and talking to people a lot recently is really like what is the value of a a new global payment system versus the value of a global uh, sovereign store of value, and it's kind of hard to to find like good metrics on that of like what is the what is the, like the level of value that could be captured by a payment system versus a store of value. Mm. Um, you know, obviously you need to be able to send money in order for the money itself to have value, but does the ability to, to do cheap, fast, small payments really add that much value to the system? It's hard to say. Um, and, and it's one of those things, you know, we're just going to have to, to see uh, what happens as we roll out the system. But like the, the whole lightning network thing is, um, it's complicated and we're doing we're building something that's never been built before yeah. and you know technically it it is working now like you can use lightning network protocols on the main network it's just very very early stage you really shouldn't do it unless you're highly technical but we're going to have to go through uh, you know 
growth cycle here of experimenting and failing and fixing the problems and moving forward. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of issues with Lightning Network, both at the micro scale, the single payment channel scale, and at the macro scale. And I wrote an article on Coindesk like two years ago, just talking about all the potential complications that might come up. Uh, and of course, there's probably plenty of unknown unknowns as well. But uh, the reason that I'm bullish on it is that there are so many people that are dedicated and are devoting you know, their skills and their resources mm -hmm. to uh, continuing to improve it. So it's the same that we see with any of these technologies. You see a lot of skeptics who say, oh, it, it's not good, it's not working, or it's well, what's that? What's that debate they give against Lightning Network? They're saying it's more centralized or makes Bitcoin more centralized? Oh, yeah. And, and that's... You know, any of these arguments of saying it makes it more centralized, uh, it's hard really to have quantitative arguments about centralization unless you're setting up a lot of metrics beforehand of saying like, this is how we're measuring decentralization. Um, I think that the more important thing rather than saying like centralized versus decentralized is like, does it retain its permissionless aspects? Um, or are we moving to a like custodial trusted model? And so I think that what, what you see happen a lot with the rhetoric in this space, especially against Lightning Network, is um, people make arguments for why it is more centralized, and then they, they kind of slippery slope you from cent more centralized into like a custodial trusted solution. So like you could have a fairly centralized Lightning Network that's still permissionless non-custodial. Um, those two things don't have to go together. But in general, I think the best way that I can describe this network is just by like looking at the internet itself. And so we're just building routing layers on top of Bitcoin, exactly like uh, you know TCP IP routing layers were built on top of the ethernet layer. And that's how we have a scalable internet right now. Like if, if the entire internet worked at the like level zero ethernet layer, which is a broadcast to everyone uh, communication protocol, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing right now. We wouldn't be able to stream video and do high bandwidth stuff because everybody else on the internet would have to receive and, and relay this uh, stream and everybody else's streams. So, I mean, this is a like tried and true method for scaling you know, decentralized global protocols. Um, so I think at that like macro level, it's going to work out fine. We, we're just going to have to deal with a lot of edge cases and uh, minutia that we find along the way. What do uh, wallet providers or service providers need to do once uh, Lightning Network is implemented? Uh, well, they're going to have to start running Lightning nodes that can speak that protocol. Um, they'll have to start storing a little bit of extra uh, stateful data so like each time you update the payment channels, you have a little bit of data that you need to, to keep track of. Um, it is you know, more complicated than Bitcoin because it's Bitcoin plus a new protocol. Um, they're in many cases though, going to be able to use libraries, which is uh, basically what a lot of the developers are working on right now is the low level libraries that are gonna abstract away a lot of those complexities. Um, but they, you know, they will need I'm sure to make a number of changes from the like user experience side. That's one of the things that I'm really interested to see is how well we can abstract away uh, these complexities. Because I think that in a an optimal future where Lightning Network is um, used by a lot of people, the, the average Bitcoin user should not necessarily even need to know whether or not they're making a transaction that is just mm. a simple on-chain transaction or an off-chain transaction. Uh, the, the software should just handle that all under the hood and it should just work when they click the button. You guys have a rough timeline? Uh, well, at BitGo, we are working on uh, payment channel stuff, uh, though we have kind of like a multi-phase rollout where we're going to start off and only be doing payment channels internally between our own customers because uh, we we can do that basically now uh, as soon as we get it up and running without needing like anybody else in the ecosystem to have you know lightning network compatibility and so we can already save our own customers a lot of money by doing off-chain transactions whenever possible 
And then, you know, we're going to continue to monitor, see how the rest of the ecosystem uh, starts to catch up. And, and you know, once we, we've implemented our stuff internally to be compatible, it should be easy to then hook it up with the rest of the Lightning Network as it comes online. Now, in terms of, you know, how the engineering process uh, and, and progress at other companies in the ecosystem has been going, it's actually been kind of disappointing, right? So, um, you know, BitGo was one of the first companies to uh, implement segregated witness, and we actually were a few weeks late. We, uh, we anticipated having it ready on the activation date. The only reason that we didn't was that Bcash came out of nowhere and we had to scramble mm -hmm. all of our resources to prepare for it. But um, the, it's really weird how like a lot of these bigger companies in the ecosystem have actually been a lot slower to implement changes. So um, that's, that's fine for us. I mean, I guess we'll just stay small and nimble and, and you know, stay ahead of everybody else. We're just waiting for the rest of the ecosystem to catch up at this point. Yeah, we have a long way to go. I think the money and the greed and all this fascination of getting rich quick is outpacing the realities of the technology and the capabilities. We need to have a good crash. Yes, that's right. Unfortunately, I mean, really, you know, the that the two year uh, trough of disillusionment, um, you know, it it was it was kind of disheartening, you know, looking at the price uh, and not moving for a long time. But we got a lot of work done because we weren't looking at the price. Mm -hmm. So, any final thoughts? Like, any advice for anybody who's uh, interested in getting the space, whether it's a developer or anybody? Uh, like, what would you suggest to them? Yeah, so I maintain a list of educational resources on my website at lop.net, L-O-P-P.net. Um, that's got pretty much everything you need, uh, starting from high level, going all the way deep down into the protocols. If you want to get into actual software development, um, there are a number of good resources, especially uh, like uh, Chain Code Labs and Jimmy Song, who uh, are doing developer education there and uh, they have a, a lot of good resources both online and doing like physical uh, in-person classes but uh, really if you already know uh, software development the best thing to do is just uh, find an open source software repository check out the code um, and start contributing uh, you can contribute documentation you can contribute tests uh, you know, you, you don't have to jump in immediately and start making like major uh, functional changes to just uh, get your foot in the door. Cool. Well, Jameson, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, talk to you soon, brother. Thanks. Yeah, cheers.